This podcast is brought to you by Blackbee Ministries International. To find out more, visit blackbee.org. Well, welcome to the Richard Blackbee Leadership Podcast. My name is Sam and I'm your host. It's my pleasure to be joined, as I always am, by Dr. Richard Blackbee. Well, I'm glad it's still a pleasure for you, Sam. It is. It is. And I, uh, you know, and I do mean that. Especially I, when you bring your, your uh, sweet little three-year-old with you. That yeah, she makes it more fun to she's do sweet, a podcast. Sweet most of the time, and a, and a buddy moving star too. A buddy, she has a, her acting career is all laid out before her now. Yeah, we she did got filmed the other day. Yeah, we did a little filming at our house for well, you a, the the church media team. Yeah, media, the church yeah. the church did some filming for our uh, our annual Christmas program. So we'll see yeah. see how that goes. So it was, that was a lot of fun. She had to <laughs> act out, like going to bed and... Yeah, shaking a, a, like a, one of the snow globes and sort of... So we uh, had the house decorated way early for Christmas. You know, <laughs> like we, we don't typically... We're not those people who decorate before <laughs> Thanksgiving. So uh, it's sort of, you know, we had to but just you, grin and bear it. When you Shirley Temple, that's... Uh, you know, we had sacrifices happened. had to be made. Yeah. So, you know, we... That's, you I know, can hardly wait to see that. That's going to be... She is a beautiful child and... Uh, and when she has to act or be a flower girl, she has a way of rising to the occasion. She does. It was, you know, it was touch and go there for a little bit. It was, we were just, uh, we got to the actual filming and she just kind of hung her head in her way and said, I don't want to be a movie star anymore. <laughs> well, that's intimidating for an adult when you get a film crew showing up at your house and it is. telling you to do certain things. Yeah, but it is. Good for her at three, she pulled it off. So Yeah, I'm, well, I'm, I'm very proud of her. She did a great job. And, and so we're, we're looking forward to the, to the finished product. That's probably the last time she's asked to get in front of a camera. That's a <laughs> probably not. Job. Probably not. No, not at all. <laughs> So, uh, well, if you've listened to our, our podcast for any length of time, you know, we've made a, a number of changes and, you know, we've added different segments and sort of mixed up how we do things. And, um, you know, for us, that's, we're, we're always looking for, for ways to improve. And yeah, so we're going to get it right one of these years. <laughs> eventually we'll, we'll strike gold. If we, if we just dig long enough and far enough, uh, we'll have to hit a treasure at some point, um, but that's that's not always the case. Uh, I think when you if you initiate a change in your life, like you're motivated enough to make that change. But um, that's not always uh, how change works. And sometimes you're asked to change, and sometimes changes come from on high, and uh, you know you're you're requested to to get on board with change. And I think uh, by default, human nature uh, really doesn't like change and we've talked yeah. about change before and uh, today I thought we'd look at it again yeah and I, I thought we'd kind of do a bit of a book review today Sam uh, a book by Carrie Newhoff he's a Canadian a leader ex- leadership expert uh, I think based in the Toronto area um, he uh, has been a pastor and brought about significant change in a church and so that the fact that he's still standing after that <laughs> is a testimony that he um, did some things right. And uh, I just recently read his book. Now, it's been out about 10 years, uh, but it's called Leading Change Without Losing It. Um, five strategies that can revolutionize how you lead change when facing opposition. And so this is particularly written toward leaders who feel they need to change something, but there's people opposed to them. And uh, like you said, uh, the, it's, it's hard enough, Sam, when you, when you need to change something yourself. But when you're trying to change others, <laughs> then that that's going to another whole level. And so this uh, he it's a it's not a long book. It's an easy read. You can pretty well read it. I think I read it on one flight. It's like 118 or 20 pages. Um, and uh, Carrie also has a, a great uh, podcast as well that um, has a lot of listeners to it. And uh, Carrie and I are actually going to be uh, visiting with each other next week. Uh, both of us have a heart for. Uh, for leadership and certainly church and nonprofit leadership as well. But I thought I'd maybe just um, walk through just a little bit of, of what he says and then just add a few things myself because you cannot lead today and not ever have to change anything. Uh, yeah. Society is changing so much, the economy, culture, technology, uh, the just people's attitudes toward work and uh, toward other, working with other people, it's, there's so many things that are in play these days. Uh, you you have to keep 
uh, moving it you know and even something as simple sam is just this podcast you know you you're always finding new technology or better microphone or a, a better studio or there's just always something that we need to adjust and um and that's just part of you know leadership and ministry or work business uh and um and obviously in some ways the the most successful organizations are the ones who navigate change the best and so so he he particularly writes this uh, for those leaders who are facing opposition, and so he has five five uh, principles or strategies he calls them, which I thought would be a good way just to start. And so he says when you're when you are going to lead change, uh, recognize first of all he, what he says do the math, and and that in part means you you know you're going to face opposition. Um, but it, it, you need to do the math and figure out, okay, where, w w w like, how does it all uh, kind of play out here among my people? And he says that there are some people in every organization that are going to be early adopters, and they love change. And so, and they're always open to it. They're, they may be more open to it than you are. But so when you suggest some, a, a change that needs to be made, there's a, there's a, a particular percentage of people that are going to always be very open-minded to it. Now, they might not initiate it. They might not make it happen, but if, but they'll embrace it mm -hmm. if, if you will lead them. And then he says there's another larger percentage of people that are not necessarily early adopters, but they are, but they will adopt it. They will go along. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, he, he kind of says the early adopters are kind of the people that when a new iPhone's coming out, they're the ones staying up all night before so they can get it right away. Yeah. Uh, and then there's a group of people that are going to probably keep updating their phones. They, they're just not going to spend the night in front of the Apple store to get it. Yeah. You know? They'll it come may around, be a year after the but they'll, they'll get <laughs> the it. Release. They're gonna. They're not really against change, but you know they're. Um, but they're gonna. You know they're not fanatics about it either. They're, and and then there's some that uh, you know that need convincing, um, and they're they're kind of like well why, you know th this maybe is not a bad thing, but what I've got is is perfectly good right now, and so there's no need to change. And so maybe eventually when my phone just keeps on breaking down on me or I've dropped it too many times, uh, you know, eventually they can be convinced, but uh, it's, they're, they're going to be kind of in the rear of change. And then he says that there are those who are just going to oppose change, just flat out there against it. And, uh, but he says that, and, and this isn't, I mean, there are studies that kind of have broken this down and, and evaluated organizations, but he says that, as a as a rule of thumb, generally there's only going to be about ten percent of your people that are actually opposed to change, and he says now they won't they won't feel like ten percent because they tend to be very loud and they tend to be very aggressive. It and might they'll, feel like eighty percent or ninety percent. And of course, they want you to think that they're eighty or ninety percent, and so they're the ones who'll typically say, "Well, there's a lot of people who feel." Or, you know, there's know a lot I'm of people. I not the only said, one. <laughs> yeah, and uh, it's like, well, where are they? You're the only one here in my office uh, shouting at me right now. But yeah. but they want you to know that they represent others. It's it's a lot bigger than just them. And and uh, and he says, because they are very persistent and vociferous and loud, uh, he says, you you tend to, they, they, they want to hijack your attention. They, they want you to. Uh, just realize you got to always be thinking about them. And if we keep pushing forward with this change, well, I'm going to have to deal with them. And I know he'll be back calling on me again, and I'm going to have to face him down. Do I, do I really have that in me again? You know, maybe it's not worth it. And so he says, you, you have to do the math. But he says, now the problem is that if you succumb to the 10%, well, then those early adopters, the first two categories in particular, uh, who recognize that change is necessary, um, if they keep seeing that the 10% hijacks the change and it doesn't seem like the change is ever happening, then you'll start to lose them. Hmm. And so he says, do you want to lose 70% or so, 60, 70% of your people over time because you didn't want to face down the 10% that were opposing you? Yeah. And he says, so that's why he says, do the math, figure out, um, okay, First of all, as we look at change, I need to get my bearings here and realize, even though this angry person in front of my desk here is 
trying to make me think that he represents a large number of people. The math suggests that actually it's a small percentage. And so I just need to decide which which group I'm going to appease. And 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 he goes on to say, especially if you're a church or a nonprofit, um, the, the math even goes beyond that because he says, let's say that Let's say you're a church of 100 and you, you want to make some adjustments so you can reach your community and there's, there's 10,000 people in your neighborhood that you want to reach that are not going to church. But 10% of your congregation, in other words, 10 people are against it. So you've got 90% that would ultimately embrace the change and move forward, but you've got 10% or 10 people saying, we don't want to. Well, so, you know, in one sense, you have to say, do we want to sacrifice the 90 people for the 10 that are against it. But he says the math goes beyond that because if you don't make the change, then the 10,000 people are not going to get the ministry and be reached like they might have been had you made the change. So now you're looking at 10 people costing 10,000 people. Uh, and so he says, just do the math. And you'll. And typically that just begins to make it very clear to you what you need to do and yeah. and what's at stake if you don't do it. Uh, how many people will pay the price because you didn't change something? And uh, we, you know, we we tend to just in the end say, well, I just I just uh, for my own sake, I guess I just need to not uh, upset the, those that ten percent. But 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 look in the eye the ninety percent and all the people that won't be reached in your community because you didn't change, and then then you realize, okay, then for their sake, uh, the math is compelling that we really do need to make a change. And a second one that's kind of related to that, he says, choose your focus. And basically, what it, when he's talking in terms of, for instance, a church making a change, uh, and you, you tend to change because uh, as a church, you're always at, you should always be asking yourself, how are we going to reach more people? You know, maybe we're a church running 100 people, but there's 10,000 people in our neighborhood that aren't going to church. Um, you know, we've been doing church this way for the last 20 years, and those 10,000 people have not come to our church yet. They've not been saved. So probably doing the same thing for another 20 years is not going to reach very many of them. Mm-hmm. So, but what if we make some adjustments in how maybe how we do worship, uh, you know, how we do outreach, how we get involved in the community, how we, we spend our budget, maybe more toward reaching out to others and so on. And so he says basically... You've got two two questions to ask. Uh, one is, uh, do we do we want to focus on who we're going to try to reach, uh, and say, okay, our focus as a church is going to be on unbelievers, people that are unchurched right now, uh, and so let's let's focus our efforts on how to get new people, uh, unsaved people, or do we want to focus on keeping the people we have? Because, you know, out of that 10%, if, if you just oppose them and say, I'm not going to give in to your uh, efforts to, to, to resist change, then so, you're going to lose some of those people. And so, uh, and they'll threaten that. You know, they'll threaten to say, we're, we're, we're not going to give, we're not going to keep attending, we're going to leave the church if you do this. So sometimes, you know, you can, you can give in to that bullying and say, Okay, well, I don't want to don't want to lose that that family. They're they give a lot of money to the church. They serve. They've been here for a long time, but by by choosing to keep them, it means you don't reach other people. And mm-hmm. so he says, ultimately, you you just have to decide um, who you want to keep or who you want to to, to, to gain, and, and that that would apply to business as well. If you're going to change products and you're going to try to find new customers, you know, you may have some staff that. They, they really like doing things the way you've always done it. And you might lose some staff as you're trying to gain new customers or to make some, some needed changes. So, um, again, you're, it's not that you probably, you're not, there's, there's going to be a cost that you'll pay. It's just a matter of do you want to lose some disgruntled people you already have or do you want to just never gain new people that would have been thrilled to have received ministry from you? So, so that's a that's a second one. So you so you do the math, you choose your focus, and uh, maybe one other just before the break is just um, he he says an interesting thing. He says uh, find a filter, and what he what he means by that he says without a filter, everything sounds compelling, 
And so every person who comes to your office and pleads their case about why you should change or not, you shouldn't change, uh, they can all make a, you know, compelling case. And so, but, but I, and I've known some leaders who tried to just to make everybody happy, just whoever they were talking to at the moment, uh, they would agree with and say, well, you know, you've got a good point and yeah, that's, we'll try to see what we can do about that. (laughs) But the fact is you can't do everything. You, You can't keep everybody happy. And so essentially you have to decide uh, who do I want to keep happy and, uh, and who do I listen to? Uh, whose voice uh, should have the, the greatest weight with me? And of course you can have some people that just want to change everything every year and they, they're, never, you know, they're always looking for the next thing. Yeah. And you want to say, is that the person I want to listen to all the time? I mean, just constantly changing things just for the sheer joy of change or... Uh, that's probably not. Do I want the, the person that is always against everything, no matter what, what we do? Is that who I want to listen to? Um, and, and what he says is, try to imagine saying, what kind of person is going to successfully take our organization into the future? Who, wh- wh- what person could I, I hitch up with and say with confidence, yeah, with people like this on my team, we can boldly go into the future mm-hmm. successfully. And sometimes you look at some grumpy members that are against everything and say, well, they're not taking me into the future. Um, so if I, if I appease them, if I make them happy, I pretty well forfeited the future. And then you've got other people that uh, are always supportive. You know, they're, 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 they may need a bit of time to kind of get their heads around the, the latest change, but but you know that they mean well. They're not trying to oppose your leadership. They they serve. Uh, you know, I've, I I think I've shared before that uh, I had some people in my church when I was a pastor that at times would uh, cause me some opposition. They they push back on some things that I I thought we needed to do. And but um, but the, they worked hard and they gave they they financially they supported the church they they served in, le- in leadership and you know whatever it was we did they came and they participated and so i would listen to them i i would think well okay they're not an early adopter but i think in time they'll come around and i'm going to listen to them and i'm going to you know i'm going to i'm going to be patient with them because i i need i need laborers like that i need people that are, they, they do care about the church, mm-hmm. and um, they, you know, once they come around, they will serve, they will participate, and be involved, and they will give. And if we're going to go into the future, I need people just like that in the pews. So, um, so I'm going to heed them. And so he he just says he, he I mean he had a couple of of I think two questions he would ask of people. Uh, in, as far as his filter goes, he's not saying you need the same filter that he had. But you need to decide, okay, if I've got 100 people in my church all coming to me uh, arguing their case, I've got to decide who do I listen to. I can't, I can't make everybody happy. So uh, who am I going to go with and who can I go into the future with? And, and, and so that's a, that's a great question as well. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, it's a labor-intensive way, I think, um, of—, of getting buy-in from the people is listening to them but i think it's a very effective way to let them know that that you do hear them you're not just issuing decrees that we're going to change this and you know get on board or don't but hearing them out and i think there a lot a lot of times there 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 are um you know good points that people who may resist early on bring up and that helps you know shape how you make that change and uh, I, I think that make, that's a big deal, I think, for people to feel that they've been heard. Not that you, you cave to every one of their demands or, or see it 100% their way, but I think it, it, it cements that buy-in from the people you're leading. And I think that's, that's critical in change. Well, let's take a quick break here, and we'll wrap up when we come back. The CSB Experiencing God Bible invites you to know and experience God personally. In this revised and updated edition, based on the best-selling Experiencing God book and Bible study, you will be encouraged to focus on the major purpose of Bible reading, listening to God speak. Experiencing God features and study helps placed throughout the Bible 
provide an immersive reading experience that will guide and challenge you to respond to the invitations God offers to know Him, His purposes, and His ways. The Bible is on sale now at blackabeestore.org, and you can find links to these in the show notes. Well, if you've been uh, keeping track, that's that's three points out of five, <laughs> and uh, we've got two more to go here uh, as we wrap up this podcast, Richard. Yeah, Kerry Newhoff, uh, his fourth point is attack problems, not people. And uh, and I think that's a really important one. And, and yeah. Sam, you were kind of alluding to it there just before the break, um, that... Uh, you know, because someone isn't just immediately buying into the change you're suggesting does not mean that they oppose you, that they don't care about the organization, Mm -hmm. that they're not good people that love, love God. Um, they just don't see it quite like you. They, they maybe haven't had the on-ramp that you had, you know, you've been, you've been mulling this over for months and you just now presented it and they, they haven't had those months yet. So, uh, you, you got to give them some time to do the same legwork that you've been doing. Uh, and so, you know, you, you mentioned, I think it's a good point, um, just listening to people. Uh, I found oftentimes people will, will be concerned and they'll bring something up. And uh, like I remember one time in the church, I was, I was uh, making some changes and it was, it was leading to some growth. And we were, you know, numbers were going up and new people were coming in. And, um, and I had someone ultimately that kind of came and they were they had served faithfully and were, were very involved. But, but as I listened to them, what I realized they were really, I mean, they, they would kind of be concerned about this and what about that? And it, it seemed a little tedious to me at first. It's like, this is just nitpicking stuff, you know, but, but ultimately it, it kind of came out. What they really were concerned about was with all these new people coming in, would they, would they lose their place? Would they not be important anymore? Mm. Uh, would I, would I be so busy focusing on all the new people that I didn't have time for them anymore. And, and they were a little insecure about that. And, you know, I, I, I couldn't let that hold uh, us back. We obviously we're not there just to make a handful of people feel special. We were there to grow and, and reach new people, but, but it did, it did uh, alert me that they, they did need some attention and I, I'd be foolish to race off to, to the new you know, fields and harvest and, and, and the band and all the people that have been holding it together over the years. Yeah. So that was good. I, I listened to them. I didn't change necessarily what we're going to do, but I did make sure to take them with me and to reassure them that I cared about them. And I, and I did. And I, and th- the whole time I was there, um, I, I made sure to include them and talk with them and listen to them and joke around with them. And, and I, I gave them my attention, even as we had to focus on a growing number of new people coming in. And so, you know, don't, don't, don't because someone questions your approach to, to change, don't necessarily look at that as an attack on you. That could just be a difference of opinion. And, and treat it like that. Say, well, you know, I, you've got your opinion, I've got my opinion. Uh, and, and we can we can discuss that and and as Gary uh, points out in his book, you know a lot of things are not really theological differences. They're just what he calls cultural differences. Mm-hmm. They're just preferences. Uh, you know, you might really prefer ordering chicken over beef when you go uh, to a restaurant, and and I might do the opposite. That you know that's that's you prefer that. I prefer this and. A lot of times when we have debates about change, it's really more about preferences, about whether we do it this way or that way. And if it's not, if it's at that kind of level, then you don't get too uptight about it. You know, it's uh, that, I, and, and there's a lot of things I could, you know, I, when I'm doing change, I just want to see the change take place. I, I'm usually not all that uptight about whether it's done this way or that way, mm-hmm. uh, as long as we get to the destination, you know, so I'm, and and sometimes that's actually good. To, it's a good way to compromise and, and and demonstrate that you've listened. You know, by saying, "Okay, well, yeah, that's a good point. We could do it that way. Uh, we could add that. Yeah, you know, we could incorporate that concern as we move forward." You know, right. well, of- if it's accomplishing the goal, you know, I think it's okay to be flexible with the methods. Yeah, don't get so uptight. And I I think sometimes you know you you can say, "Well, I just don't like to compromise or." or scale down uh, all the vision I had for this change. But, but sometimes uh, it's, it's, it's a currency that you have sometimes where you yeah. can say, 
okay, look, you're, you're letting me have the change I really want to, to see happen. And in response, I'm going to pay you back by letting you make this modification because yeah. it's it's secondary. It's not primary. And so. Well, and that generates the buy in from people. And so I think if you if you come at change with a fully formed plan and say, this is how we're going to change. This is what we're doing. This is why we're doing it. And this is how we're going to accomplish it. Um, well, then you're kind of leaving people with like, well, I either get on board or I don't. Yeah. But it. when you leave that, the methods kind of open for people to make suggestions or, or to, to have some wiggle room to make uh, allowances for different things while going towards that goal. I just think that makes the buy-in from the people you're, you're yeah. leading way more significant. Yeah. Like, you know, you say, okay, we need to build a new fellowship hall for the church. And we, we, I really want us to get that space. There's so many things we could do with that. And, uh, and, but then, you, but but in your initial plan, you have blue carpet in the, you know in the design, and they push back and think it should be green. You know, it's like, well, do you want to die on that hill? Like, do you really care? It's you're going to have your fellowship hall, uh, whether it's green carpet or blue. Uh, and so, but you know, but because people got to choose the color and they chose the paint and the the style of chair, or whatever. Um, now they're all in because yeah. now they think it's their idea too, and 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 you've got your fellowship hall. But but I know people that they every detail they they want total control over. They they have this perfect image of their vision of what they have, and they don't have any room for people to participate. And for me, I just never worried about that. I as long as I mean I I want high standards if they're going to start to try to really scale things down and make it third rate uh and i wanted it first rate i i I may kind of draw the line but but colors and certain designs and things like that yeah um you you know let's add this little thing here it's yeah sure you know that i'm actually kind of happy about that because that's that's showing me that they're buying into it they they're starting to think about what it could be like as well and how it could even be better uh and so yeah. So when when people oppose you, um, don't always take it as a personal attack. Sometimes it's just they need time to buy in to feel like it's also now something that they are, are contributing to and and with the ideas and so on. And then the last one that Carrie says is just don't quit. Um, just don't quit. If if change is uh, important, uh, then don't let uh, people discourage you and demoralize you. And, uh, because, because for organizations to move forward into the future, they have to change. And, uh, and if you just give up on change, even when it's hard, when people oppose you, then, uh, people are going to pay the price for that. And you, you can only imagine, uh, how many good things would have happened, how many people might've been ministered to and blessed had, leaders just not quit on on change because it just got hard and so um so his ultimate uh, advice is just stick through and you you might have to make some adjustments on the fly you might have to kind of uh come up you know sort of reconfigure a few things and figure out how to include some new ideas but uh it might mean uh, that you've got to go toe to toe with some blatant opponents who just aren't going to be happy no matter what you do. Mm-hmm. And it might mean you have to lose some people along the way. But uh, uh, but 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 in the end, you've got to say, but I'm willing to do whatever it's going to take so that ultimately this change takes place. And maybe just one thing I'd just throw in, uh, well, two things real quickly here at the end is, uh, you know, and of course, this is, uh, Carrie is particularly focusing on uh, dealing with opposition, but... Uh, but I would just say the the flip side of that too is just build a coalition. Don't uh, don't ever try to just bring about change all by yourself. That's a recipe for failure. Yeah. When you're the lone voice just trying to change things, I, I've seen pastors do that. They knew their church needed to change, but they they never got people onto their team and and enlisted others and and helped them realize how important change was and enlisted them to take some of the lead and do some of the speaking and, and, and so on the, some of the leg work and, and leaders just got worn out trying to carry the load all themselves. It's like playing in a football game where they, they carried the ball every time and they're just being pummeled after a while. Like they, you, you need, uh, don't, don't kind of move forward with change until you've got 
some key people on side with you that are willing to support you and speak out on your behalf and uh, and do a bunch of the work. And then uh, timing is just another one. It's We've said this many times, but there's the right thing to do, and then there's the right time to do it. And great leaders recognize timing, and they recognize, I think, there's enough uh, discomfort, there's enough pain at this point, people are experiencing that they are ready to change. And as long as you can get by doing it the way you always have, it's it's hard sometimes to get consensus, we need to change. But uh, but once you start losing people, uh, when you when your sales are going down, when uh, people are are walk, you know, visitors are walking into the church building, they look around, they see that there's nowhere to sit, so they walk out the door and go home. Then you realize, okay, uh, I guess maybe it is time now to think about a building plan or, or a, a different approach or a second service. And so um, you recognize when people are ready. Uh, great leaders have that sense of timing. And don't if you try to change things too soon, uh, you're, the opposition is going to be a lot greater than once people recognize, yeah, I've kind of sensed for a while now that we couldn't keep doing things this way. And so... Um, keep keep an eye on that and be careful. Uh, change expect opposition. So um, you know before you lead change, you want to you might want to just make sure that you have some real strong relationships with your executive team or your your elder board or your deacons, whoever it might be. Um, make sure that those relationships are strong and healthy before you decide to launch into a change because that always shakes up an organization and uh, it'll test your relationships and your leadership. So make sure all that's healthy and in good good order uh, before you say, all right, it's time to change something. Yeah, well, change is uh, inevitable if you're wanting to move forward, but uh, it doesn't have to be impossible. And I think these are some great uh it's great advice for anyone who's who's looking to lead change. And as always, we'll leave uh, links to this book uh, yeah. in, in the show notes, Leading Change Without Losing It. And uh, it's it's always nice to, to get a good leadership book that's uh, that's quickly readable as yeah. well. So I know <laughs> yeah. a lot of folks who listen are, are busy, uh, and so that's always helpful to, to have a quick read. And uh, until next time. Thanks for listening to the podcast. If this is something you enjoyed, it really makes a difference if you leave a review and a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. Don't forget to subscribe and share with your friends. We always love hearing from our listeners. So email us at podcast at blackv.org.